guys. All right, everyone can actually hear me. It sounds like uh, that was that was God Baez, and that is his last name is actually that Baez that you guys are all thinking. I I, I kid you not, he's related to that Baez. He is also known as the guy who uh, signed the check. All right. So, uh, well, welcome to uh, Facebook. Oh, sorry. Welcome to Facebook. Welcome to Pirate at Facebook. Uh, I hope you guys will enjoy uh, the, the next two days. I know uh, there were a lot of interesting things going on uh, yesterday. And today, I want to kick it off with talking about why I think Python, Python is pretty good when working with uh, data at any scale, really. You know, we talk about big data, there's small data, all kinds of different scales, and we'll kind of see uh, uh, what it is that we can do with Python. Hopefully through a story, actually. I like to tell stories. So in this particular case, I'm just going to set it up so that we're talking about a startup, pretty new startup. You're the CDO. You're trying to implement uh, a bunch of new stuff. And uh, you know, the CEO is actually going after, uh, going after different kind of clients. And uh, the task at hand is implementing a machine learning system to do something. Uh, we're not going to go into the details of what you're going to do with it. We'll just focus on how you're going to actually implement it and how Python can help. And the goal is really to get acquired by a publicly traded social networking company for an undisclosed but sizable amount. And um, I should also say, obviously, you guys can see the disclaimer. But after I put the disclaimer there, I kind of felt bad because it's not true. I do have direct influence over acquisition decisions of my wife, <laughs> kind of. All right, and of course the answer is use Python to get there, right? And I'll talk a little bit about the why part and why Python can actually help you in that particular setup. And there are five reasons. We're going to talk about five reasons. Uh, and we, we, I kind of uh, sorted them uh, in the order that you might need as you progress in your startup. At first or now, you, you, know, you want to get results very quickly. You need lots of functionality. Later on, you might need to speak C++. I like C++. So you guys will figure that out. And then eventually, you will need domain-specific languages. And you, know, you can't do it all by yourself. You need people. All right, so you want to get the results uh, quickly. Let's talk about that a little bit. There's an elephant in the room, right? I mean, this is, uh, uh, and whenever we're talking about getting to results very quickly, there is indeed an elephant in the room that we need to address. And that's the fact that the 80-20 rule is alive and kicking. In fact, data preparation is still uh, the most time-consuming part of the whole thing. Uh, so when we talk to, about getting results quickly, we're actually, we actually have to take into account the data prep part. In fact, I'm pretty sure if by this time you haven't seen this tweet, <laughs> they take your data scientist license back. This was, I believe, uh, posted last year in, at Strata uh, uh, about a year ago. And you know, it's kind of funny, but it's also kind of true, right? All right, so let's talk about how Python can actually help you in this particular case. Now, here, here I'm actually setting up a very simple data frame. We're just going to uh, play with toy examples in this case. In this particular case, I have gender data, height and weight. Let's say you're a biomedical startup or something like that. And uh, very typical of real life data, you have missing data uh, as well. And uh, when you're actually doing a lot of competitions or when you're looking at books, uh, missing data is not really dealt with a lot. But this is our toy data set. And if you actually wanted to process this in Python, super easy. You don't have to know or you don't have to understand uh, a lot of the details of the corner cases and things like that. You just need to know the basics of it. And then you can actually use uh, Pandas itself, which provides you with a lot of different methodologies. And scikit-learn, one of our uh, favorite toolkits around here, to do uh, uh, standard normalization, to do label encoding, to do label uh, binarization, and all other goodies. And eventually, you can drop down to Pandas and, again, uh, do uh, uh, merges and all, all other kind of stuff on your data frames, on your data tables. The interesting thing here is these are not really that hard algorithms. They're not that hard, but they're all these little tiny corner cases. So it's already taken care of for you, and Python can actually help you uh, get there fast. And uh, from that data set shown in the label number one, we go to uh, label number two, missing data interpolated, everything normalized, everything binarized, and we're good to go in just about 15 lines of code. And we do this every day here at Facebook, this kind of stuff. 
All right, so data prep is done, but you know, machine learning still requires a lot of machinery, hence machine learning. Plus, there's that little secret of data science folks that everyone kind of knows, but no one really talks about it very, very explicitly. And that is the fact that big data actually means you either sample, you distribute your computation, or you stream data. There is no other way, really. This one I stole from uh, Jason is going to talk uh, later on today. Big data really means your memory is small. That's really what big data mean, means. And the smaller memory you have, the smaller the data can get, and you will still consider that a big data. So when you're actually dealing with uh, a setup like this, where your data simply does not fit into memory, what do you do? You devise, uh, you devise architectures like this. And the first time you actually see this, it might look a little bit scary, right? There's a bunch of batch operations, mini batch operations going on. There are a few CPUs. There are a bunch of different machines. Then you aggregate uh, your classic leaf aggregator kind of an architecture, just passing down the results of whatever algorithm you're running, either a machine learning algorithm or some other uh, data algorithm that you're running. And it looks, it looks kind of scary. Yeah? That's, the, that's the reality of it. So let's see actually how we can do this uh, with Python uh, relatively easily, it turns out. So this is the uh, Amazon Movies uh, data set from uh, Stanford SNAP data set group, I guess, or collection of data sets. It's basically movie reviews and then their corresponding uh, uh, rating that are given by uh, different people. And uh, Ryan is actually going to talk about uh, this kind of setup for sentiment analysis later on today. Uh, and, and he will mention how we, how we do that for, uh, 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 on, on Facebook data. But I'll, I'll focus on the Amazon movie review stuff. So it's nine gigabyte of data. It's really not that much. But you know, it still requires, especially if you're going to run it on a four gigabyte uh, 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 Macintosh laptop kind of a thing, it still requires some manipulation. So here's what I did. I used scikit-learn again. Hashing vectorizer, if you don't know the hashing trick, learn it. It basically just takes all your reviews, the text, vectorizes the whole thing using the hashing trick so that you don't actually use a lot of memory. SGD classifier from scikit-learn again, using the partial fit method, which allows you to actually mini-batch everything. And joblib, which comes with scikit-learn itself, just dump all your, uh, all your models that you calculated on individual CPUs. At the machine level, you're essentially just copying those models back to the aggregator. And at the very end, you're loading them up, and you're just taking their average. That's it. That technique, by the way, is, is a pretty cool, pretty interesting one. And obviously, you can get very complicated here. You can actually do feedback loops and all that kind of stuff. I'm not really going into the details of, that, uh, of, of uh, uh, all those um, advanced things that you can do to improve your results or to get to more mathematically correct uh, methodologies. But this, as is, is actually pretty standard. You can do this in scikit-learn today. And if you're interested in learning about more about that last part, there was actually an excellent talk uh, last year at PyData Silicon Valley by Olivier. I don't think he's here today. Uh, just check that one out. You can actually uh, uh, learn all about the details of how to do that linear averaging. So the interesting thing here is that thing I actually uh, just wanted to test myself. So I was able to implement the whole thing in four hours. Python, nothing else. Well, OK, there's GlusterFS over there. and We already had some infrastructure. But other than that, right, it's pretty cool the fact that you can actually do this and you're able to suddenly process gigabytes and gigabytes of data in just a few hours actually is a testament to the power of Python. But I'm preaching to the choir. All right, and it's not really the point here, but I just used the default settings and still pretty good precision and recall in that uh, movie review test. All right, so the, the moral of the story here is if you really know your libraries in and out, libraries like Pandas, which I've been using it for a few years now, I don't think I know all the methods that it has. It's really, really very rich. Or scikit-learn that surprised me every day, or any other library that are in the PyData space that you get to use. If you know them, you can get the results very quickly. In just a few matter of hours, you can actually process the same amount of data that we process here at Facebook. So that brings me to my second point. You will need lots of functionality. There will be those little things, like I was talking about the whole GlusterFS thingy, and you know, that's that's essentially uh, the kind of functionality that you will need, and you will need lots of it for doing uh, different kind of things. 
And Python has, um, for a very long time, known as batteries included language, right? This, if you ask me, changing a little bit, I want to say rather than batteries included, it's probably batteries easily available. And the reason why I say that is even though we have 200 plus modules in standard Python, uh, some of them are kind of outdated. But we have about 40,000 modules on, on PyPy. We have about 300,000 repos on GitHub that you can actually use to do all kinds of interesting things. Here, here are a bunch of libraries that we use around here. You know, these are all the usual suspects that you probably use in Lao, and we use them for different reasons, sometimes for experimentation, and as you'll hear uh, during the rest of the day, sometimes for actually doing uh, production work. Uh, but this is not all. There's a lot more, obviously, and uh, I want to kind of talk about what else is out there, especially coming from Facebook, right? So here is one. This is uh, open sourced on, on uh, GitHub. And if you're a Facebook employee sitting there, and if you don't recognize the name, come, come find me. I'll tell you what the internal name for this uh, open source project is. Uh, this is a, if you wanted to implement Python-based data services in just a few dozen, of, a dozen lines, there you go. This will actually take care of it using Trift as its basis. And we use this a lot every day in uh, some of the things that we do here at Facebook. Plan out. Eitan talked about this yesterday. It's a recently open sourced uh, uh, library uh, from Facebook that allows you to do very sophisticated online experiments. And again, all written in Python. Well, here's something that's not written in Python, Presto, distributed SQL. Uh, but it actually is blazing fast and super easy to integrate with Python because it provides you with an HTTP API. If you're dealing with big data, I have to say you have to give Presto a try. It's really pretty good. It's one of the best uh, that, I, that I had the pleasure of working on. It makes life so much easier. And if you don't want to deal with the HTTP API yourself, well, here's an API from Dropbox that will actually speak to Hive and Presto all at the same time using standard uh, Python uh, libraries. That makes life easy for you. Set up your Presto cluster, and you can actually very, very easily go and, and uh, run uh, things using Python to get your data. Here's another, um, here's another data store that uh, I'm a big fan of, RocksDB. This was built on top of LabelDB, which is from uh, Google, which kind of is the local version of Bigtable. That's a long chain of inheritances over there. And it actually is uh, 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 really pretty cool if you're uh, operating on Flash and all that kind of stuff. And again, easily accessible from Python. Using something called Cyton, if you haven't heard of it, I'm going to talk about Cyton later on. And finally, one of my favorite libraries it actually happens to be the fourth popular library on, on GitHub, Facebook's Tornado, to actually serve different kinds of web pages. And when I show this, people are, well, that's not really a data thing. Well, uh, Jason can tell you how we're actually using Tornado for all kinds of very cool visualizations and data services. All right, so how do we use these things? I'm just going to talk about a few examples, and then you'll actually hear it from the other guys. Uh, later on throughout today. So here is uh, the, the um, it's not a tool, it's not a product, I don't know what to call it, the physical object that we call Insights Wall. And if you guys haven't seen this yesterday, if this is your first day attending, or if you haven't actually went to Building 15, today, go check it out. Next to Building, uh, uh, next to Son of Ping Pong, which is where the other talks, uh, other sessions are going to be taken care of today, there is this giant wall that is a, actually a touch screen that allows you to play with uh, Facebook data. And if you don't believe me, that's actually a person right there touching the screen. All backed by Python infrastructure. Uh, it uses Trift, it, it uses Data Swarm, it uses Presto, using its uh, uh, Python connector. 100% uh, uh, Python backend actually supplying the data into this thing. And you guys can go and play with it today, whereas it's available today. Yeah, that's <laughs> All right, so here's another thing that you guys probably seen uh, before. I don't know. I think Paul, Paul is here, um, or at least I was told that he was here yesterday. This is the famous picture from Paul Butler. I think it was um, year 2010. Uh, original, I believe, was implemented in R. Uh, and then Paul later on uh, came up with a Python implementation. And that thing over there, which is currently uh, Mark Zuckerberg's cover photo and used in many other uh, places such as our internet org announcements and things like that actually rendered by Python. 
Now, granted, and the data comes from Data Swarm, which Mike will talk about. Uh, granted, we took the original code and modified it a little bit. There is a lot of data in there. So it was uh, taking a very, very long time to render the whole thing. But we didn't need to go anywhere else. We still used Python. Using Python's multiprocessing and features modules, we were actually able to uh, parallelize the rendering onto 32 CPUs and take care of the whole thing in less than 10 minutes. And that's the, uh, what you're seeing here. As I said, these are two very simple examples. We'll actually talk, uh, you'll actually get to hear a lot more uh, today uh, uh, about the kind of things that we do using Python. Eitan, well, I said today, I lied. Eitan actually talked about plan out yesterday. I know it was a well-attended session, so hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Jason is gonna talk about uh, uh, how we actually bring all these technologies for data visualization later on near uh, Son of Ping Pong in Building 15. Ryan is going to talk about sentiment classification, that Amazon movie reviews thingy that I mentioned. Well, this one is the Facebook version of that. Using uh, our very own, well, not our, but Python community's very own scikit-learn. And finally, uh, Mike is going to talk about data swarm. And I don't think, actually, that uh, tagline is on the, on the program. Uh, so I think we should talk about that a little bit. Uh, data swarm should really be uh, you know, subtitled um, how to move 300 petabytes around. And you can, you can actually listen to Mike's talk about how, how we do that. All right, so the moral of the story here is, if you know Python's rich ecosystem, you can actually have lots of functionality. You don't need to go elsewhere. Python provides you with a lot of hooks and functionality that will allow you to do that machine learning task that we set up all the way at the beginning. Well, all right, it, you know, it's, it's all nice, but eventually you might, you might actually need to speak C++. And if you're using a lot of the numerical libraries today, you are kind of speaking C or C++ without knowing. That's because the, the need for speed happens. Sometimes we actually want to run things really, really fast. And the fact of the matter is C, C++ has a lot of established libraries that you can use and uh, that you can actually uh, tweak to your liking. So it's, it can be useful. We like Python, but C++ can be useful. It can be powerful, right? And at this point, I should actually also probably um, open a parenthesis and tell you why I like C++ so much. <laughs> so this book, I think uh, it's probably um, older than 10 years now, Modern C++ Design, uh, written by Facebook's very own Andrei Alessandrescu, is probably the first book when I first started understanding how powerful C++ can be, right? Now, granted, Andrei, since then, actually moved on, and he actually works on the D language now. And I will sneak in a little bit of advertisement. There's going to be a D conference at the end of this month, again, on Facebook campus. It's just so that Andre doesn't get mad at me for mentioning his old days. All right, with that, we'll close the parenthesis and continue. So I said C++ can be useful. And the, thing, the fact of the matter is it's actually super easy to call C and C++ code from Python. Now, there's the good old standard C types. If you have never seen it, there you go. That example is complete with the exception of the compile step. I have that little C uh, uh, file up there, uh, labeled by label number one. You know, say, add, all those functions. And by using the C types module that comes with uh, Python, you can actually very easily call this code from your Python library. Cool. There's also other stuff like Boost Python, uh, Vive, which can be very powerful. Also, might want to you know, make you cry. Uh, Swig, uh, which is also quite powerful and complicated. But my favorite, as I mentioned at the beginning, is actually Cyton. Now, if you never work with Cyton, if you never use Cyton, give it a look. It's pretty cool. Uh, in, that, in this particular example, I'm actually not showing you how to call a C or C++ code from Cyton. But this, the PyX file that you're seeing, will compile into C++ by Cyton. It requires a little bit of a setup, which is shown in, in label number two. And eventually, you can actually call it just like any other library uh, uh, from your Python code. And it's all nice and, uh, nice and dandy. And you know, Cyton is actually pretty powerful. It's used by a lot of different libraries. SciPy uses it. Pandas uses it. Scikit-learn uses it. And a lot of other libraries also use it. The RocksDB driver that I was talking about, it's actually written in Cyton. Very, very useful library. But it introduces complexity to builds. And um, when I'm talking to Python guys, when I mention this, they go, what are you talking about, building Python? What, what, what does that mean? 
And you know, the reality of the matter is, yeah, you can actually build Python. And here's our little secret. It's actually even easier to call C and C++ uh, from Python if you're working for Facebook. And you can get a little bit of taste of that today. Here's an open source um, library that we open sourced, I think, about a year ago called Buck. It's mainly used uh, in the outside world for building Android applications, but it actually has rudimentary Python support. And you can go to their group and, and uh, 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 read about uh, how that part works. It looks something like that. The Python binary, you give it a name, and then you tell what sources to include. And there are some dependencies that you can actually mention. Today, in the outside world, Python support in Buck exists, and you can use it. We use a very similar system internally, and we actually have Cython support internally, which essentially means instead of hello world.py, if I change that to hello world.pyx, all that setup step that's normally required by Cython is taken care of for me. So that actually empowers people a lot. That allows us to do a lot of interesting things. And then, you, know, you, don't, you don't need to uh, uh, restrict yourself with Buck. There's another one from Twitter. Uh, that will allow you to do similar things. I don't think it actually has direct uh, Cython support, but I believe it's uh, relatively straightforward to add that. It also comes with uh, something called a PEX file, which is a Python binary similar to what I showed before. And many other companies also have uh, similar tools, that uh, build tools that you can use. There's, a, there's an unobvious benefit to this that a lot of the times when you're actually getting your hands dirty with data and you're about to implement the machine learning system, nature language processing system, or something like that, that's not immediately obvious because you're very focused on trying to get that. And that unobvious benefit is the fact that this kind of build system takes care of dependency management. And dependency management is not nice, right? You don't wanna, you don't wanna deal with that. Even with pip and virtual env, it's, it can actually be hard, especially if you're using libraries like uh, uh, NumPy, SciPy. Now, um, friends at Continuum have this awesome environment that actually makes that life easy. But if you're running this stuff on your own hardware, sometimes you need to compile it yourself. And in that particular case, a build system like the ones that I'm talking about will make your life really, really easy. And they're out there. They're, they're available. And you can actually use them today to uh, basically give yourself an edge in terms of uh, being able to run uh, your Python code on any machine that you desire without setting it up ahead of time. Check it out. Those Python binaries are pretty powerful. So the moral of the story here is, yeah, pip and virtual uh, env are nice, but if you're linking to any uh, non-Python code, get a build system, and you will actually be quite happy with the results, I promise. All right. So one of my favorite topics, the, the domain-specific language stuff. Uh, it's also sometimes not very obvious why this is actually important for data science things. So here's the, here's, the, here's the story, right? That's Tower of Babel. I believe the story is, is, is the, before uh, there was one language and then after there were multiple languages. And there's a reason why we have so many languages, right? Because people's cultures are different. People actually uh, need to uh, talk about different kind of things. And that's why we have so many languages in humans. Computers are no different. Code has to scale, not only by number of users or by amount of data, but also by number of employees you have in your startup. Now, we, were, we started at day 42, and you only had two employees, but that's going to grow, right? If you're going to get acquired by, by that social networking company, you're going to have a lot more people, 20 or 50. Uh, and in that particular case, the number of employees, as they go up, it becomes important that people understand each other, not by the language, English, or whatever other language they're speaking, but also with the computer language that they use. And domain-specific languages can actually help you a lot in that particular case. They're especially very effective when it comes to uh, you know, when you, you're, you reach critical mass of a few hundred people. All right, so why do we use Python for inside Facebook? We use it to define services for our internal cloud. We use it to distribute configurations to data centers. We use it for data ETL pipelines. This is data swarm that Mike is going to, where's Mike? Mike is going to talk about. And there are many, many other examples. And it works really, really well for that kind of stuff. So here is one example from data swarm uh, so that you guys understand what I'm talking about when I say DSL. 
The label number one, hive to, hive to file operator. You don't need to actually know what this language is doing. You can immediately see that, well, OK, it's probably getting some data from Hive and putting it into file. It's very, very obvious. It gives it a name, export unused pages in this particular case. And then it defines something called a PHP operator. Clearly, it's going to do some kind of uh, PHP functionality on here. And that particular operator actually depends on the previous operator that we defined. That's a DSL right there. And as you can tell, it's, it looks like Python. In fact, it is Python. And it will execute anything else that you might want to have in, in your Python code. But it works pretty well in this case. And at the, uh, in its heart, it's essentially just defining a dependency graph. Uh, as I said, Mike is going to talk a lot more about this. But that's what it does. It's a specialized language to define a dependency graph that allows you to move a data around. And when I say data, I mean 300 petabytes of data around very, very easily by actually chopping it out, uh, down into these small pieces. And that has a lot of benefits to it, simply because everyone understands the commonalities of the language, so they know uh, how to read those files. Not everyone comes up with their own little tiny different way of moving this data around. All right. So there's a, there's a technique that I like a lot. This is not how Data Swarm is implemented for, but there's a technique that I like a lot, and I think it shows the power of Python when you're dealing with domain-specific spe languages. So I'll talk that, about that a little bit. By the way, if you're familiar with this meme, since I was using all historic you know, pictures before, I figured I'll pick this clown instead of the one that you normally see. All right, so let's say that you are trying to come up with a language called My Cool Script, all right? And the extension, very fittingly, will be MCS. And uh, you want to be able to run this thing by uh, running something called runmcs.py. You pass the file name, and then you get some results. That's the goal. And let's say that in this particular case, what we want to have in our MCS file is that simple expression, y equals 2 times the list of 1, 2, and 3. And you're setting the answer to y, and, and that's how it gets printed to screen. Now, if you try to use the Python interpreter, that's what you're going to get, what's shown in label number two. Right? Python will actually interpret that as uh, replicate this list. And it will actually do one, two, three, one, two, three. But that's not what you want. What you really want is as if all these arrays are NumPy arrays, so that you can actually describe a very complicated model, for example. Uh, or you know, uh, a machine learning model, or a time series model, or, or, or something else that you're developing this, this uh, DSL for. That's what you want. You want what's happening in number three, but Python does not give you by default. Well, it turns out you can actually get there very, very easily. If you're not familiar with the AST module abstract syntax trees, they are perfect for uh, domain-specific languages. They will actually allow you to do really interesting, really crazy things with Python language without getting out of the Python interpreter itself. We'll talk a little bit about this, but what's essentially happening here is you read a file, your MCS, my cool script file. Uh, you send it to the AST module for parsing, and then you run a visitor, uh, the transformer, no transformer on it, and I'll show what that does. And you get your results that way. So essentially what's happening here is every time Python sees that particular expression, two times one, two, three, it actually hands you that, uh, that uh, structure that you see on screen. It's a binary operator. There's a left. There's the operator. There's the right part. And uh, that's actually what Python gives you through the AST module. And this is exactly what Python itself uses to actually implement the thing. And since this is just another Python structure, you can actually run this particular code. I know it looks a little bit complicated. I will very briefly explain what it does and get to the result that we wanted to get. This essentially visits every expression in your Python script, in your cool script, excuse me. And whenever it sees a number and a list, it will automatically wrap it with an NumPy array. You don't need to do anything else. The interpreter will actually take care of this. And the last, the red function, is actually where, how we're setting the answer. And you can see it's implemented very, very simply. The interesting thing here is if you take this piece of code, which is what, 15 lines, and combine it with this piece of code, which is not much, this is a complete program. Right? I think I'm missing the import statements. But other than that, everything else is on those two screens. 
And if you run this thing, it will actually start implementing your domain-specific language in the way that, that, uh, that I just described. And that can actually be uh, developed into very, very complicated domain-specific languages that allows you to do pretty cool things with uh, you know, data science topics. So what are the advantages? First of all, I think everyone agrees here that Python is a pretty beautiful language. I, don't know. I mean, I personally sometimes will look at Python code and will go like, oh, it's really, it's, it, it looks nice, right? It looks nice. So I like that about Python. So you still keep that property, but you get to control it in any way you want. Uh, you can actually hide the details from non-engineers. Uh, you can actually enforce different kinds of business rules. The last line, reproducibility and machine readability, is, is my, my favorite topics. And reproducibility actually covers a bunch of other uh, uh, areas that might not be very obvious. If you're actually, if you have a very advanced DSL, the way that they're described, where you're wrapping a lot of stuff, so the fact that you know, NumPy, Scikit-learn, all those users are hidden, but they're still text files. They're still Python files. You can check them in. You can compare your models using a source control version uh, very, very easily. You can reproduce. If you're doing time series forecasting, for example, that's one of my uh, favorite topics ever. If you're doing time series forecasting, for example, and you want to know how come I got this result from my forecast four months ago? If your entire forecast definition was implemented this way and checked in, A, everyone else, including the business analyst who might not necessarily know Python, will actually get trained to understand what it is. And B, you might be able to diff it. You might be able to see why the, mo uh, the model actually shows you different results. And the machine readability speaks into or plays into that thing, and it will actually, um, it will actually bring a bunch of other benefits. For example, remember I was talking about uh, the data swarm being a, a dependency graph description language uh, kind of a thing. Well, since it's implemented as a DSL, it allows you to do things like this. Structure, it's Python, but it also has structure in it. So you can actually slab a dashboard on top of it and suddenly you can see how those dependencies are actually working out. As I said, Mike will talk more about uh, this stuff. It's pretty powerful. Uh, 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 you can do pretty powerful things using Python as your DSL. And uh, the interesting thing is all frameworks, all APIs eventually kind of you know, converge to a DSL of their own, either the way I described, which is pretty cool, but you don't have to do it that way. Any mature and structured API is essentially a DSI. All right, so the moral of the story is when you finally need that DSL, Consider using Python itself as the basis of DSL because it works beautifully. Everyone understands how it works, and you can do very amazing things with it. All right, so I'm almost done. We talked about a bunch of technical things, and I talked a lot about not directly data science itself or machine learning itself or natural language processing itself, but I talk a lot about the infrastructure because that's uh, you know, one of the things that, that I care about a lot too run data science on a sound infrastructure that Python provides us. But at the end of the day, all that cool code that actually does a lot of machine learning stuff, all the functionality that you have that you get from uh, GitHub or PyPy and all that kind of things, all the C++ libraries in the world and all the DSLs that you can design are not going to help you. You still need people. And you cannot do it all by yourself. And this is the cool th part about the whole thing. Community is important, and Python actually has a pretty good community. Right, Python itself has been uh, uh, also known as a growing and vast and very diverse community. But um, we have other things. There's like on Stack Overflow, one of the most popular languages. And I'm not even showing the Py data related stuff here. Even without that, it's actually pretty, uh, pretty popular. And there are all kinds of physical meetups that you can, uh, you can go to. This is just around here. If you, if you go and check it out, you can see that all over the country, there are different meetup uh, meet uh, that you can go to uh, to learn about Python itself, data science, uh, uh, and all, uh, all kinds of you know, natural language processing, machine learning. It's, it's all over there. Finally, there are events like this, PyData, you know, which is a pretty cool event. This is. Um, I follow a lot of different conferences. This is by far one of the uh, favorite conferences that I have 
on, around this, this the, uh, big data, data science uh, kind of topics because it's not, what's the right way to say it? It is not too fluffy. <laughs> There's still code. People still show code on screen. I like that. Right? Uh, uh, but it's not very deep that you don't understand what's going on and you have to be an expert in the topic either. So at least for me, it strikes the right balance and I like PyData and I like having events like that that actually uh, uh, make uh, Python community uh, what it is today. And finally, of course, if you choose Python for your startup on day uh, 42 of your startup, you'll be in good company. We have a lot of folks around here that actually like uh, uh, to use Python inside Facebook. All right, with that, I think I actually managed to finish about 10 minutes early, which is a miracle. But I'll conclude and, and um, I'll open up for questions if you have any. <laughs>